Greetings. I'm Holly Hughes, one of four co-curators of the Northwind Arts Reading Series. Since the closing of the Northwind Arts Gallery in March, in keeping with the state guidelines, we've taken the Northwind Arts Reading Series online. You can find a link to each monthly virtual reading on the Northwind Arts Center website at northwindarts.org. For our September reading, Linda Robertson and I are pleased to be hosting local Peninsula poets Carmen Germain and Jerry McFarland. Both have collections out within the last year, and we're happy to celebrate with them. During the pandemic, it's more of a challenge for authors to get their work out into the hands of readers, and we're glad to assist. If you enjoy the poetry you hear, please consider ordering their books from your local independent bookstore. I'd like to introduce both readers, and then you'll get a chance to hear their work. Carmen Germain will read first. She taught at Peninsula College in Port Angeles for over 20 years, where she was a co-director of the Foothills Writers Series. Holding degrees in literature from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and the University of British Columbia, she is the author of the chapbook, Living Room Earth, and the collections, These Things I Will Take With Me, from Cherry Grove Press, and The Old Refusals from Moonpath Press. Cider Press Review nominated her work for Best of the Web in 2016. She's been nominated for a Pushcart Prize, and she has received a Washington Community College Humanities Association Award for Poetry. In addition to writing poetry, she is also a visual artist and a wonderful visual artist, I might add. I've seen her work. Reading second will be Jerry McFarland. Jerry McFarland served as an editor at Floating Bridge Press in Seattle until 2011. His work has appeared in Contemporary American Voices, Bayou, Crab Creek Review, Crucible, Limestone, Meridian Anthology of Contemporary Poetry, Cider Press Review, and the Wisconsin Review, among others. He was a finalist in the 2014 December Jeff Marks Memorial Poetry Prize, and his chapbook, Gunner, was a finalist in both the Grace and Chapbook Award and Frost Place Chapbook Competitions. His first full-length poetry manuscript, The Making, was published by Cave Moon Press in 2019, and I believe that's what he'll be sharing with us tonight. So please welcome Carmen Germain and Jerry McFarland. Thank you. Welcome to this virtual reading in the Northwind series. It's a pleasure to share the time with you, even though we can't be in a social space together. My name is Carmen Germain, and I'm going to be reading ekphrastic poems inspired by visual art that spoke to me and wanted a response back. I'm also a visual artist, and I move between painting and drawing and language and poetry. It's also intriguing to learn how many poets, as well as fiction writers, do this. And E.E. E. Cummings was one among many. In a mock interview he created, he was asked if poetry and art making get in each other's way. To the contrary, he said, they love each other. So the poems you'll be hearing come from the last section in my book, The Old Refusals published by Moonpath Press. The cover art is a slice of my painting, Fantasia in the Key of Yellow. This group of poems is called Color is to Do Everything, which is a line from a letter Vincent Van Gogh wrote to his brother, Theo. And color is what attracted me to the art you'll be seeing in these poems. So we're going to start here this reading a long time ago by a painting by the German painter Hans Holbein the Younger. He died about 1543. This is nothing new, how summer obsessed by skulls blooming under every face or grieve a flaming sunrise decaying to night. Seeds sprouting to compost, newborn shrinking to crones, bird song in spring, the end of music among the shedding maples. Nothing new how the performance artist steps into bones through holograms, strips his body to essentials, fights the desire to sleep in a coffin. Or the gallery where I walk through mist, 
water sterilized after washing corpses, how I'm asked to confront mortality as though it never entered my mind. Nothing like the 16th century where skeletons and woodcuts drag bodies away by cowl or beard, a mariner jostled in seas where death rose up in his bone cage. A merchant tallying a shipment where death grabs a cape and the merchant turns, arms raised. Death scooping his worth in a basket, the seller flinging up empty hands. In Holbein's double portrait, two men gaze at me, bishop in collar, ambassador in black velvet robe, lined with white fur, flute in hand. On the mantle near where they pose, lute with a broken string, globe, sundial, crucifix. But what disturbs as though the painting plots five centuries ahead, where Dolly's timepiece drapes the desert tree and a pocket watch melts, the gray and yellow distortion growing from the bottom of the canvas, an unknown grotesque, as if the artist slipped. And the picture's meant to be hung over a doorway where someone walking would look up and pause. And there it is, Holbein's optical trick revealing a skull. Like the bathroom mirror where I stare half asleep in the morning, body aging, taking all that I'm given. The Dinner Table Portrait of Camille. This is by Matisse. And what makes him interesting is, among other things, he was risking in his art his potential livelihood. He departed from the dogma of the academy, and he didn't know if this apostasy would ruin him. They said it would, and all the critics said it would. Camille was an early companion of Matisse in Paris. She was a working class young woman, and as such, she often supported uh, these women, often supported young middle class men who came to Paris to learn to paint. Parents were fine with this arrangement until a suitable middle-class wife could be found to take care of their sons. Camille was the mother of Matisse's daughter and she shared his early poverty. Such young women found a grim future. Single mothers would lose their jobs. And in this case, Matisse took his daughter with him into a subsequent marriage to a suitable woman. So Camille had a lot at risk, I think more than Matisse did. The Dinner Table, Portrait of Camille. What would she do another winter with no heat? How Matisse never slept, worrying about his paintings, other artists starting to sell, knowing what worked and what didn't. She must have begged him to think of his child, how it would feel pockets heavy with francs meat whenever they wanted. Maybe she set it up, the still life, burnished borrowed cutlery, porcelain, and glass, laid the tablecloth bought fruit out of season with whatever money they had, hothouse lilies. That winter he worked in coat and gloves she posed as serving girl and he meant it to be real. Color subdued, knives painted so sharp she might slice her fingers the way a feast for guests should look, drapery gracefully muted, shadows curving fruit. But then peaches flamed crimson, blushed orange, Lemons deep in pigment, wine carafes blooming burgundy and cobalt, white highlighting white, cloth brushed by saffron and ivory with a band of red. And the serving girl bending to fuss with the flowers, her face luminous in blue violet, splendid color, anything he felt it to be, not what it was all the painting dancing in front of his eyes, all he saw. But I think of her, returning the bone-handled knives, the plates, the bowls, butcher and baker holding out their hands, and the pears too ripe, bruised at the core. So Matisse found his suitable woman, and her name was Amelia. She was very devoted to his art, but it wasn't easy being married to a man who was married to his art. This is The Green Line, Portrait of Amelia. When even making love wouldn't work and he couldn't sleep, incendiary colors exploding on canvas, she'd read to him until early in the morning, 
maybe Dante and Virgil among the shades. Maybe together they'd imagine hell for madmen who called him a lunatic, a room carved in ice, walls glowing, flame and freeze burning the same, a place in Hades for detractors who claim people caught smallpox standing too close to dotted brushwork. A critic said, the artist makes you see her in a strange and terrible aspect. Amelia not gazing at us, posing for Matisse all those hours, remembering him roaring when he couldn't get light to dance on a tree, an emerald mark splitting her soft and hard. Most of us know Van Gogh's story, how difficult it was for him to uh, gain confidence in doing what he was doing. He was filled with doubt, um, which was interspersed with confidence. And um, what I'd like to do is talk about a contrast I found between two paintings, one by one um, person who sold and one by Van Gogh. So this is uh, Fields Under a Stormy Sky. The same year Van Gogh shot himself behind a dunghill in a barnyard, Herman Corodi painted View of Corsica, a picture that sold. No tough island pony stamping and sweating under saddle blankets. Only he climbed the hill, pallid and easel tied with ropes slapping his ribs on the narrow trail. Goat cheese wrapped in newspaper, apricots spoiling in southern sun, flies and gnats upwelling from broom. Only serenity at the precipice of a chasm. Barbary fig and rock roses and gray green and burnt sienna, vapor rising from the cleft of cliff, sea and beach, stone lighthouse, mountains framing sky, coastal jag below, but no peril in this landscape. So unlike Van Gogh's cobalt purple sky, Strange thunder falling to the field, empty of women or men. And waiting for harvest, yellow slashes the horizon. Turquoise flows green, stabs of red spike among wheat. Oh, Picasso, man of many colors, shapes, and forms. This, uh, this is his uh, muse. She was only 17 when he met her, one of his muses. Her name was Maria Teresa Walter. And she was a beautiful young woman. You can see her swath of blonde hair. This is uh, after a painting called A Girl in a Mirror. And uh, the poem I'm going to read is about Olga, however. This is Picasso's first wife. And Olga had a very difficult time with the fact that Picasso was um, enamored by muses uh, left and right, uh, which made his art what it is, uh, his life studies, his life drawing, everything that we appreciate about Picasso. Now, um, he called himself a, a minotaur, and he loved the beach and loved um, painting the, in the south of France because of the light. So the cabana that's mentioned in this poem is a special place where people could have privacy for um, sexual encounters. So the, the Minotaur took advantage of this. And I'm just trying to think what it was like for Olga when she first saw and understood and knew that Picasso was great because of what he was doing with his art, which included the muses. So this is Olga confronts modernism. As for me, I have no fear of art, Picasso said. But how was it when she first saw the bathers, the concave yellow of his lover's hair, how every oval offered a vagina, every cabana, the minotaur's lair? Near salt water, the sun spread its red scarf on a giantess and her sisters, thighs massive as pylons of a wharf. And from a mirror of many colors, a girl with a belly of moon gazed at a man. You can paint with whatever you want, hooks and nails, the hearts of women. What you see here is Flowering Apple Tree by Pete Mondrian. He profoundly influenced abstract art through his paintings and writings, and you may be familiar with him, most familiar, 
with him through his grid series, the Broadway Boogie Woogie um, geometrically uh, focused uh, art pieces. What he claims is true, Death Cap rises after rain in the forest, hits trap in Viper's coil. So Mondrian decrees no fellow feeling beyond geometry, admonishes contours of nature should be tightened. So what is the tree to Mondrian? Why does he so despise the natural world, deny the red plum growing outside his window, deride the willow groves, close eyes to all that's wild? A drop of sperm spilt is a masterpiece lost, his gorgeously demented theory. His art a box built to withstand tough handling, unlike the flame red, blood red rose. Clear nights, the earth's a flute of wine, a near grave waiting, while his flowering apple tree turns like terrible fish riled in jacklight. Anna Zanmankova, who lived from 1908 to 1986, she was Moravian, uh, was a, a woman who came to art late in her life. She discovered it early, of course, but then she had to make a living, and her parents had a lot to do with that. Uh, I discovered her at the Santa Fe Folk Art Museum. She worked a lot in colored pencil, and she did not title her paintings or her drawings. So the title of this is uh, Untitled, Distemper on Paper. She has an epigraph here. Like catching a key to something, that's what I feel when I draw. At first, in her old age, Corollas burst from another planet, spiky orange fronds, muscular and throbbing, devouring each other, splitting flesh petals. Her grown children wanted to keep her occupied and suggested she start painting again. How long ago she dreamed of the art academy. Now seeds pricked paper, rubbery tubes arose, ochre swirling to brown striations, bulbous at tips with clusters of holes, lotus pods resembling poisonous animals like the de death stalker scorpion. Purple brick walls growing leaves red as clotted blood. Studied dentistry, her parents must have said. You can't eat paintings. Matisse's father wanted him a merchant. Cezanne's groomed him for the law, but how could she bear it? Those years of filling teeth, cleaning, drilling, staring into what grinds, tears, and gnaws. I was uh, researching Guantanamo prison art, and there are many archives that you can find online. Uh, beautiful paintings. Uh, these are men who are considered low risk. There are no trials yet and were allowed, therefore, to take art instruction. And then, uh, somewhat later, I was at the Fry in um, Seattle and looking at their permanent collection. And I saw a German painting and was struck by the juxtaposition of this German painter and the prisoner who both created a landscape. And it was in such great contrast because of each man's incredibly different life. So this is uh, Guantanamo Prisoner Art, Camp Delta. Consider a landscape. Ludwig Dill's Birkenwald, the Birch Grove, 1900. Full summer leaf stream, pale blue sky like shredded silk between the forest's dark colors. Shadowy purple, maroon, cold gray. Creek curving off the canvas, yellow striking the trunks. Last light swerved toward dusk. No figures are still life, only trees sharing sun, breathing serene, the world lush before a war and waiting. And this watercolor, painted more than a century later, a man yet to be charged, drawing behind a bolted door in an art class for the guilty until proven. His hand too follows shoals and ripples, vanishing in woods, marks of his brush where he thought here, twilights wash like scorched butter. His cedar lying broken, crowns split, the cut slicing the life root, the sunset hanging over the world. I love Van Gogh, and this next poem doesn't speak directly to this painting, but what it did was it in it motivated me, encouraged me to get out my paints and work on an art piece. 
Color is to do everything. Five days of rain and now this clean morning pulse of pure light. Luminous on the silver peacock plumes iridescent blue green. Whenever I gaze at it, said Darwin, makes me sick. It's inexplicable art grounded in the functional universe. Silent chickadees stab gray weeds for seed. By noon, leaden clouds weigh the valley dull. Battling gloom, I load my brush yellow, wild hue burning like southern sun. Why we stirred red ochre with bison fat, painted Lascaux with reeds and pebbles shaped like birds. Shells evolving from the limestone oceans to bones, to hands that abandon the sea. I'm going to leave you with my ink drawing woman as dance too. And I'll leave you with her because she's surrounded by language and its music and art and its power that sustains her. Thank you for listening and seeing. Stay safe and well. And again, thank you to the Northwind Reading Series for continuing the work of Bill Mawinney and keeping poetry and art alive. The Making for Tim. Close on a hammer. His hands are like hills, swollen places on the earth, palms open, become rough plains, each line a minute stream bed circling discolored calluses. At evening, seated under kitchen light, elbows on his knees, palms open as a stubble field, he picks at scabs, fingers newly blistered false in a ritual of reparation to the god of the unfinished. Tomorrow, his hands will make a house. Mute instruments will build from air the fact of wood. Join opposing forests. There must be a new word for such making. In morning light on the hill, pine studs will frame the house of the new word. The molten sun light the house's bones. The hands will start things off. Blocks will hold promise and the smells of pine, sawdust, earth, and rain will be new. Rejected by a little magazine, the poet repairs the faucet. In the window over a cramped yellow kitchen, Light fractures in the cherry branches. The blossoms fell last month. Pink edits on the fresh green page. Deep in the faucet, the gasket is worn. Water sputters in the silver throat and the whole thing bangs and quakes. Light steps in the leaves of the cherry, fixes me to the floor. Wrench in one hand, lead neck of the battered fixture in the other. Damp, dark stuff sent up unfiltered into every kitchen, drips black onto the floor, pools on linoleum, a tiny black lake of corroded iron. Once I ran a plumber snake down their larynx of the house, into the bowels, until it gurgled, popped, and spicked back loose crap from the deep. But this is a simple repair, just a humble little washer. There. One branch in the window frame jerks like an elbow, deleting thoughts, ending sentences. White fists of light cross the room, fly back into the cherry tree, apart from the plumbed world, to mingle with leaves, shake loose the last of the soft pink thumbprints. Skipping Stones, San Fernando Valley, 1964. I remember the sway of her forearm, gentle as she stepped small by my side up the hill to the dam at the end of the steep boulevard. 
the man-made lake. Summers, then, were loose, sunny, long as the warm sidewalk uphill from her yellow house. We didn't know the dam would burst when the fingers of the old fault worked loose the bound water onto the evacuated neighborhood. We were 13. We didn't know she would be thrown from a horse in Denver, restrained in the brilliant room while well, they set the bone, scrubbed the wounds. We knew the words to Unchained Melody and all the names of the Beach Boys. We were the small flesh of the world. We didn't know the imminence of her father's death. I didn't know what it meant when my forearm brushed against hers. The stone has to look like this, I told her. She showed a girl's disinterest, wandered mute down the shore, touching the hair she had spent the last hour setting. I demonstrated how to fit the stone in the knuckle, bend close to the water, swing the arm, parallel the earth. I threw my heart out the end of my fingers. Monsoon for Joyce. I want to tell you about the monsoon, the plank bridge from the gate of Subic Bay Naval Station to Longabo, the Yellow River children dive for coins in, how the monsoon made Alangapo a lake, men into dark silhouettes, slow as divers on a dirt town's nameless single road. The monsoon drenched this wide-clad sailor, American dollars hidden in damp shoes. Pink and blue fringed canopies of jeepneys lurched and splashed the puddled road past monkey meat on fire drum spits. The fountain ringed by stone faces chipped in every election's gunfire. Baby ducks thrown to alligators for a peso. In the monsoon's spontaneous embrace, my uniform translucent in the warm flood, the brown bottle of San Miguel I drank outside in the mud. I thought of you in that clean and sunny yard, your face like a pale blossom. The monsoon baptized Alangapo, granted extravagant forgiveness, made the road dark slop, tin rooftops rattle. That was my last visit to Alangapo City. Long before Mount Pinatubo plumed over Mindanao, Luzon, and thick gray dust grew to wind-blown shapes of pickup trucks on the abandoned base, and a long post strangled in soft, hot feathers. I've forgotten what you look like. Never saw the Philippines beyond a long po. Never saw the rain tree forest the swing of light in another country. Oh, Longapo, oh, Longapo, I keep saying your name. Oh, Longapo, once full of sticks and gunfire, deepened in a new volcanic skin, jeepney's axles wound with the tendrils of the koa. I enter your dark street with a shovel and an axe. Scoutmaster. Never lost driving any suburb in L.A. He gripped himself like a steering wheel. He looked straight ahead all the time. He could drive anywhere in a straight line. Every time he turned the wheel, the world straightened out. Each new house meant more than what had been left, sold, unsaid. He just kept his hands on the wheel. Sometimes when he looked into the mirror, thought he was trying to see backward, as if to find that one thing fallen from the truck he'd not been quick enough to save. He took my brother and me, his two sons, fishing once at a man-made lake, where you paid to fish a stock of trout with strings tied to the ends. 
I remember his thick fingers fooling with the string and the tiny knot, trying to see into it, untangle it. He drove us back, arms straight out, wrist hooked on the wheel of the black truck, eye on the mirror as if to see a dozen trout in the bed come back to life. Gunner experiences cleansing of the soul. Drunk and back from liberty, disheveled, out of uniform, they stopped me at the gate and put me against the wall, then released me, seeing I am faithless. Outside, the warm and fat-dropped monsoon falls like a lake to drown any fire, cleanse any filth, alter any heart. I stumble on the road, my uniform sopping. When I am drunk, it is my job to forgive. On the dark road, monsoon, a crash of silver. I trip and pitch to my hands and knees, spill to the pavement, alone on the base. They should see me now, I think, as I push myself back up to my knees. Lucky they let me in the gate. I forgive them. Still on my knees, I raise my face to the rain to try to find coordinates in the dark. River House for Wren. The river crashes over stacks of rock. On waking, I thought it was traffic noise, an air conditioner perhaps, not the river, placid little Greenville, poised on either bank. I had forgotten where I was in the dawn, whispering late out of darkness. Not in the clatter or steel air of the cities, but in the unhurried place about the river, enduring syllable of longing from the mountains, above which trees cross and uncross against the sky. The river's song as deep and full as my sleep had been, La Lost. So far, my waking slow had understood a river in the dark. I'd stay if I could. Snapshot at the border. Southern Honduras, 1987. For KMR. Two happy campesinos. From behind, she throws one arm across his chest and says, the words escaping from her silent mouth, let's stay. We can remain unnecessary here like this in light and chemicals. Embracing himself, he gazes out beyond the boundary. The camera apprehends him. The hardest part, she told us, was crossing there. After this last trip, they found the tumor. This shot could have been taken anywhere but in Honduras, the sky blue as guns. But that's where these two briefly made their protests. Here she is holding her dying man, arrested, laughing, lips grazing his ear. The Oak in the Grave, Père Lachaise Cemetery, Paris, France. 200 years it took the oak to find the grave after its roots knuckled down to it in the yards. Another hundred years, a knotty elbow at the edge embraced it, and the oak stretched its bony arms and leafy hands over a sea of stones, and took another century to lift as if in praise, the crypt from the dirt, skew the lid, spill the fine white dust from crevices, carved by hand, to signify this final matter, claim it, expose the faded etch of an ancient name. Coming to light for Allegra. 
that I could meet what comes as easily. Fix the back screen door, clean the gutters, plug the leak, replace the washer, see that the rattling faucet in the kitchen sputters less. As the first of the morning lights upon the room, illuminates the spackled ceiling, spills into the murky hallway on, to many nameless jobs to be done. This cleaning light, dust-filled, finds you still asleep, dawns on us in our disheveled house. It's time to come. And you, my wife, deep in your dream of a brighter, more useful kitchen, rouse. We start out in this unfinished place. Crossing Agate Pass Bridge at night. Lighted arms of the headlamps sweep the island's flats like forearms crossing a table. On the bridge, sky, land, and air become one darkness. We signal with our hands in the shadows, talk as if we both had just emerged. We wait for the next town to surface, Tell us where we are, how far to go, when we will arrive, what lights to follow on this frail current under the wheels. You said you had a dream the other night of falling in a car into a river, but woke before the car could be swallowed in the pass. Algae lapped at the door, silver tongues at the windows. We will recognize a rival when we see the running lights of Polsbo, and we break the surface of our small talk, startled, searching. That little store with the dirt parking lot and yellow neon sign, one letter blinking, lost, erratic, looks to me like an island in a night that swallows light like a sea. We hold our breath. We have come so far, our house is only a thought that surfaces like other dreams, fallen long ago into the river, that find their way to the bank at last. My wish is to remain here, suspended over the canal, in this dream, the shining arc, wheels spinning, until we waken and emerge, breathless, silent as two islands. Thank you, Carmen and Jerry, for sharing your work with us. The reading series team will continue to post online readings until it's safe to gather at the Northwind Art Center again. Keep checking the Northwind Art Center's website, as well as the Northwind and the Northwind Reading Series Facebook pages for information regarding upcoming online readings. We'll be posting poems and art from the Ekfrastic event soon. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>